So uh, this is a fascinating book uh, that you've Thank written. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, and uh, it's just it's great to be here with you. Um, Likewise. Uh, my uh, uh, first question is basically to try to um, you know talk about the main thesis of the book. Um, is this? Um, are you saying that we can basically reverse engineer the human brain? That it's feasible to do that so that we can sort of create a computer mind that's indistinguishable from yours and mine? Uh, it is feasible. It's uh, a level of complexity we can handle. I'm not saying it's simple, but I actually describe the basic principles of the neocortex in the book. Some people say, and I articulate this criticism in the book and then respond to it, that oh, every one of the hundreds of trillions of connections was placed exactly where it needs to be. Uh, and that's impossible. There's th th I mean, where is that design information? There's only 25 million bytes of design information in the genome for the brain, and there's hundreds of trillions of connections. So there's a lot of repetition. There's certain design principles that are repeated over and over again. And in particular, the main thesis is that we have 300 million pattern recognizers, and they're all basically using the same algorithm. And these pattern recognizers connect themselves in a hierarchy. And the neocortex is capable of hierarchical thinking. So we can develop these ideas more. But that's the essence of it. And th they're basically running the same method. And the, the secret of human thought, if you will, is the ability of each one of these pattern recognizers to build a hierarchy with other recognizers. So at a low level, we're recognizing simple things like the crossbar and a capital A. And at a higher level, it would recognize the capital A. And at a higher level, it's, oh, the word apple. And at a much higher level, oh, that was funny. That was ironic. These pattern recognizers are all basically the same, except for their position in the hierarchy. Now, where does this hierarchy come from? Well, we're not born with it. I mean, language is a hierarchy. In fact, it reflects the hierarchical structure of the neocortex. Obviously, we're not born with a knowledge of English or Chinese. Uh, in fact, every all of these connections that reflect our knowledge, our memories, our skills, our personality, we create, the neocortex creates from our own experience. So you are what you eat, but even more importantly, you are what you think. Mm -hmm. I've got a one-year-old grandson, and he has laid down several layers now of, of, of this conceptual hierarchy. We basically can work on one layer at a time. and But the layers have been set to some extent um, by um, biology, by, the, by, as you say, the genomic information. So it's sort of a combination of things well, that we're the, talking the about. Well, the ability to create the layers is there, but a, newbor a newborn is struggling with understanding very basic sounds and, and uh, shapes and, and touch and uh, is laying down the most basic uh, level of this hierarchy. And, uh, the reason that a child can learn material like a new language so easily is that they have all this virgin neocortex. I estimate we have 300 million of these pattern recognizers. We have filled them up by the time we're 20. Now that doesn't mean we can't learn new things. <coughs> Anything we've learned like I've learned the crossbar and a capital A, and I don't just have one copy of that. I've got probably hundreds, maybe thousands. I can give up some of that redundancy to learn new material. In fact, I can give up old memories altogether. That's why we find me old memories and old skills fading if we don't revisit them. So we do have ability to, to get old patterns, to learn new ones. Some people are better at that than others. Uh, but that's one reason a child can learn so readily. They have this virgin neocortex. But this hierarchy we create with our own experiences. And the process of learning, which is not just formal school education, but the interactions we have with our parents and w with the whole world, is a very important part of the development of intelligence. I mean, it, uh, you could do a perfect job of recreating the neocortex, and it wouldn't do anything useful, just like a newborn is limited in skill. Uh, without an education. In fact, that's going to be an important paradigm for our AIs, our artificial intelligences, to is to educate them. Mm -hmm. um, can you um, elaborate on um, what, for our audience, what the neocortex is as opposed to the brain? 
Right. Well, we have the old brain and the new brain. The new brain is the neocortex, and only mammals have a neocortex. And in these early mammals, little rat-like creatures emerged over 100 million years ago. They were the neocortex is the size of a postage stamp. It's as thin as a postage stamp, and it's basically the out, outer layer, like the rind. In fact, neocortex means new rind uh, of of the brain, and it's capable of thinking in this hierarchical fashion. So that's so, the that's the part of the brain that you're focusing on, right? Primarily. And uh, you know, in these early mammals, it was limited, but it actually enabled them to learn new skills that had some complexity to it. So when the environment change quickly, they were able to adapt. <coughs> that was not so much of an advantage because the environment didn't change quickly. It took thousands of years for the environment to change. So just the normal process of biological evolution changing behavior over thousands of generations was good enough for non-mammalian species until the Cretaceous extinction event. This, uh, this cataclysmic event 65 million years ago, we see evident, geological evidence of it everywhere in the world. Something dramatic happened and changed the environment suddenly 65 million years ago. There are various theories about it having to do, say, with a, a meteor, but we do know the environment changed suddenly. So thousands of these non-mammalian species who could not adapt very quickly died out. And that's actually when the mammals became to prominence in their ecological niche. So to anthropomorphize, biological evolution said, hey, this neocortex is pretty good stuff, and it started growing it as mammals evolved. By the time you get up to primates, it's no longer uh, just a flat covering of the brain. It now has all these convolutions, if you know, remember mm -hmm. what a brain looks yep. like, basically to extend its surface area. So in, in a human or any primate, it's very has all these fissures and, and curves you could still stretch it out in theory and make a flat sheet. It's about the size of a large table napkin in a human. It's still thin, and it's still the outer layer, but it actually now comprises 80% of the brain. And it's basically where we do our hierarchical thinking. We still have the old brain that provides our motivations, fear, aggression, sex drive, pleasure, but they're modulated, sublimated, by this neocortex, you can think of it as an elaborate bureaucracy that might take raw aggression and turn it into writing a poem. Uh, but you know, only primates have an ability to do that at a high conceptual level. And the big innovation, I'd say the major innovation in Homo sapiens is we have this large forehead to allow more neocortex, so we have the frontal cortex. And that greater quantity was the enabling factor that permitted the evolution of language and technology and invention and art and science, which no other primate has done. I mean, there are maybe simple examples of primates uh, creating tools or using language, but not really in this very sort of indefinitely expandable hierarchical fashion that humans do. Mm -hmm. So you are um, uh, thinking of the main functions of the neocortex as being these these high level functions such as decision making, um, inhibiting improper actions, um, well, not so much. I mean, the neocortex is a huge number of things, right, including vision. Well, no, it things, does actually lots of things at high and low levels and uses the same algorithm. So, I mean, I have lots of pattern recognizers that recognize the edges of objects or crossbars and a capital mm -hmm. A and uh, all these primitive functions that feed up and at a high level, a pattern recognizer might say, oh, she's pretty, and that was funny. Uh, it exists at a high level of, of the conceptual hierarchy. One very powerful piece of evidence that came out just as I was sending this off to the publisher is that what happens to V1, which is a region of the neocortex where the optic nerve spills in, generally it processes very primitive patterns in images, like the edges mm -hmm. of objects. So it's low level, right. very simple mm -hmm. patterns. What happens to it in a blind, congenitally blind person who's not getting any visual images? It actually gets taken, since there's no visual images, it actually gets taken over by the frontal cortex to help it process high level language concepts. So here's the same reg region that's generally doing low level concepts handling high level mm -hmm. concepts, showing that the algorithm is basically the same, and the difference is where it sits in the conceptual hierarchy. And the hierarchy is actually created 
by the neocortex itself. And there are actual physical connections, actual ax axons and